enjoy some fabulous rewards. Get a cool £10 reward when you receive £100 or more from the UK. Tell your friends and family in the UK to send money to your mobile money wallet or bank account using Express Pay and get an extra £10. Terms and conditions apply. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another exciting episode of The Dentist Show Live, where we bring you conversations that matter in our community. Now, today is Father's Day, so I want to make sure that I wish every single father a happy Father's Day to all the fathers that are role models, that are supporting their family, encouraging their children. We say thank you so, so much. And I especially want to say a big thank you to Express Pay for sponsoring this show. You can download Express Pay and send money back home to Ghana as soon as possible. And it's quick, it's easy, and it's fast. It goes straight into your, Momo, um, your mo um, mobile money or your Momo or your bank account. So you have two options. Um, today, we are going to be discussing sickle cell. Um, it's a topic that is um, <clears throat> very close to my heart. Um, one of my cousins actually had um, sickle cell, but he, he passed away, unfortunately. Um, but I think there's a lot to learn. Um, there's a lot for us to, as a society, as a community, um, to really learn what sickle cell is. Um, it, can it be curable? You know, how do you deal with it? Now, I have some amazing guests that are going to be coming on, um, you know, to really discuss about what it, what it is and how it is like living with, with um, sickle cell. Um, I read in an article that from 2010 to 2050, the number of children born with sickle cell disease is expected to grow by 30% around the world. And that's 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 quite scary, um, you know. Why is that? I think I'm, my my first guest that I'm going to bring on is Dr. Stephen Boating, um, who is very passionate about sickle cell. Um, he is the founder and CEO of No One, No One uh, Behind Foundation. He's a director of research. Sickle Cell 101. So when it comes to information, the 101, you'll get all of the information that you need. And he's also the co-host of the Sickle Cell podcast. So he's been actually doing a lot um, in a forefront. And he's the one that actually messaged me on LinkedIn. It's like, Denta, <laughs> it's well Sickle Cell um, day, you know, um, I think it was a few days ago and he said you know what are you doing for your show you know we need to discuss this and I was like yeah you're right you know it's been something that I've been wanting to do but I haven't actually done it yet so I'm so glad that um, Dr. Stephen reached out to me so please welcome Dr. Stephen onto the show. Hi Doc. Hello thank you for having me. Thank you so much for reaching out I really really appreciate it because it's it was something that I've always you know, been asked to do, but I haven't had the chance to really delve into the topic when it comes to sickle cell. Yeah. Now, um, for the benefit of my my guests that are watching, um, just explain a little bit about yourself. I know I've introduced you, um, and you know how you got involved in the area in the area of sickle cell. Yeah, thank you, and it's definitely the right time to talk about sickle cell. So, so briefly about me, um, I currently live here in the United States, but I am Ghanaian born and bred. Um, I grew up in Kumasi, Ghana. And so for me, the way sickle cell um, is personal to me because I have a sister who has sickle cell disease. So okay. you know, I, I always tell people the only reason why I got into healthcare is, is because of my sister who lives with sickle cell. But, but I think what's fascinating is, you know, I was lucky enough to, um, you know, come here to the U.S., go to school, get my doctorate degree, all of that. But I still realized and saw the challenges that people who live with sickle cell continue to face, primarily in Africa. And so it has become a passion of mine for a very long time. And I'm sure you, for those of you that do not know, Nigeria is actually the country with the highest population of individuals living with sickle cell disease around the world. So wow. it's always been something that I'm very passionate about, and, and I'm always glad to talk more about it. Fantastic. So, you know, you've just, 
you just thrown a bomb. Like in terms of Nigeria being the highest, what you know, it's in the African community predominantly, right? Mm -hmm. Um, why is that? Is it something we're eating? Is it you know why is it that it's it's in our community so much? Yeah, I, I wish it was something we could eat. We're eating so we could pretty much just get rid of it, but. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, not. You know, so with sickle cell disease, one of one of the things that's so interesting about this disease is the fact that the gene actually originated from primarily Africa because it served as a protective factor against malaria. So, you know, in general, for people that carry sickle cell trait, which is just one copy of the gene, they tend to be more likely to be resistant from malaria. So that was kind of our body trying to outsmart malaria, right, and trying to. Okay make sure we don't get sick. And, and unfortunately, for two parents that have one copy of the gene, when they both have a kid and they pass that gene on to the kid, where the kid now has two copies of the gene, that child ends up having sickle cell disease. It doesn't mean that a child that has sickle cell disease is it, going to be resistant to malaria. They actually experience malaria more worse. So that's really why we tend to see it more in Africa. And that's pretty much where it came from. OK, thank you so much for that. Um, so how important is it to check with your partner, you know, doing blood tests and checking that, you know, you guys are not going to have children with, with sickle cell? How important is that for um, people that are looking to get married and stuff? I think it's one of the most primary things that anybody looking to get married should look for. You know, unfortunately, especially in Africa, you know, newborn screening tests haven't been... Um, as predominant over there. So most 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 of the time, you know, for my research at Sickle Cell 101 and even my foundation, this is a theme that we typically see. Most people will find out that they have sickle cell trait after they have a child born with sickle cell disease. So most people are getting, for lack of a better term, getting blindsided. So to answer your question, I think especially for those that do not know their sickle cell traits, that it's always important to Find out if your if your partner or the person you're dating or you're thinking about getting married also has the trait. Because think about it, if both of you have the trait, you have 25% chance of having a child born with sickle cell disease with each pregnancy. I think that's one thing that people forget. So mm -hmm. I think it's super, super important. Unfortunately, on the African continent, we don't have a lot of newborn screen. I'll tell you, fun fact, a lot of my friends I went to Pokuari with, I, I didn't know had sickle cell disease and when, once they realize it's my expertise, most of them have reached out to me and I've had people that were getting married have the same concern and, and had to get tested. So I highly encourage that everybody to get tested and find out their trade status. Okay. Doc, there's a question on the screen for you. Uh-oh. All right. So the question is asking, our daughter has hemoglobin SC form of sickle. So unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be much research on this. Has that changed? That is correct. So one thing about sickle cell disease is there's so many different variants, right? So the most common one is hemoglobin SS. Um, there's another type that's called SC. It's, it's not as common as SS, but they also do experience the same um, symptoms and severity. I think that, you know, for now, we're starting to see more research and funding coming into the sickle cell space, especially here in the U.S. and really developed countries. So I think it's starting to change. Um, for the person that did answer this question, but we still have a long way to go. And, you know, unfortunately, most of the time people talk about SC, um, people make an assumption that they don't get severe sickle cell disease, but it is another form that can be very severe. And, and we're starting to see it being talked more about and more research is being done with it. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. I'm going to bring on Maya and Lisa. So Maya is 11 year old, a young, beautiful young lady who's an actress um, and is doing a lot in the space. She has sickle cell, but I really want her to share her story, her journey so far, and also to hear from mummy on what she goes through as a mother having a child with sickle cell. So welcome Maya and Lisa. Hello. 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 Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. So I'll start with Maya. You're 11, Maya. Yeah, I'm 11 years old. Yeah. Wow. So when did you find out that you had sickle cell? Well, um, it's always been natural to me knowing sickle cell. There was never like this time where mum sat me down and said, okay, you have sickle cell. It was just 
taught to me since probably from the very beginning or since I remember it was just like straight into like drinking always drinking water my first word was juice so that was a good sign actually (laughs) hydrated but um yeah there was never a certain time so I think I knew it since like since I could remember um but my mum found out I had sickle cell at the heel prick test when I was a newborn baby um so yeah Okay. What are the types of things that you go through um, as somebody with sickle cell? And what type of sickle cell do you have? Um, I have sickle cell HBSS. Um, uh, but um, going through sickle cell uh, means having sickle cell crisis, which is a, like a pain episode, um, which means I have to drink lots of water, stay um, stay warm, but um, not too warm. So I have to regulate my temperature. Mm-hmm eat a well-balanced diet, um, stay positive, but also get lots of rest as well, so I can't over-exhaust myself. Um, but it is difficult because, you know, some sometimes my friends can be doing, like, really energetic things, like running around or doing this or doing that. And, like, sometimes I have to miss out on those things or sit out of those things because, you know, I can't get too tired, otherwise I might, I might miss out on other activities or... Um, like so it's it's frustrating sometimes, but I mean sometimes like the, the, there's um battles and victories, but um so I have to be grateful for the good times as well. Oh, that's really good. And then, what, how were your friends dealing with you having sickle cell when you sometimes have to have you have to sit out of some of the stuff that you you've mentioned that you know you have to maybe if they're doing really really energetic stuff you can't be too involved. Um, or if there's a particular activity, you know, how was that coping with um, your friends that have, you know, that you know that you have sickle cell? Well, I start secondary school in September, so that will probably vary when I go there because there'll be way more children and they might not understand at first. Mm-hmm. But with my friends right now, they're really understanding. They're like completely get me they're so supportive um but yeah it's absolutely amazing my friends are so amazing they help me out they completely understand so yeah it's really nice to have those people that like understand and like completely just like understand and get you and they're like okay just relax or do you need anything so yeah i'm really grateful to have such great friends oh that's amazing and then what type of things have you been doing to promote Sickle, sickle cell awareness um well i have a um uh instagram account which is at sickle cell advocate and um i've been spreading awareness about sickle cell let me, let me follow yeah at so at sickle, sickle cell, cell. Mm-hmm. advocate yeah um so i've been spreading awareness when i because I, when i was seven i kind of asked why i had sickle cell and so from mm. there on we kind of just we kind of thought well maybe it wasn't for a bad reason maybe it was so i could spread awareness and show other people what it's about and um how to handle it so um yeah i've been spreading awareness for a while and um recently i took part in um some campaigns the dear sickle cell campaign mm. um, where you had to write a letter to sickle cell, to sickle cell and like say what you'd like what you think of it and then we did the uh, Sickle Cell Champion song by mm-hmm. Little Crown Story House, um, which wow. teach, teaches early years about sickle cell, or just anything really, in a fun educational way. And um, we also, um, we, uh, my mum actually gave blood today as part of the United by Blood campaign in memory of Evan yeah. Nathan Smith, which was really good, um, just to like to help more black people, encourage them to give blood because there's not enough black blood donors. Yeah, yeah. Why, why, why do you think there's not enough black people given blood? Uh, do you want to take this question? Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's all sorts of reasons. There's the historical reasons where black people may not trust the system, the medical system. You know, in the past, it 
they ha- the system hasn't been good to us and so once bitten twice shy um, it might also be it's not really the done thing in the community so you'll kind of emulate and do things that you see so if you see your parents or grandparents doing something then you will do it too so it takes more maybe it's a generational thing we need to teach more young people to do it and once the young people get doing it and it becomes normalized then their children will do it then and it will it will continue mm-hmm. um maybe there's also a fear people there's different things people have a fear of needles there's there's all well, kinds of reasons Absolutely. Conditions. Some people can't give blood from health conditions. So, I mean, there's a, there's, there's a whole lot of reasons why people don't do. And I mean, if you can and you're willing to, then please, please do. I mean, in the UK, there's about 15,000 sickle cell warriors and only 1.4% of donors are black. And so wow. there is a desperate need for more donors and when you donate one donation can help three adults or, or it can children or 12 children and, it, and remember it doesn't just help people with sickle cell it can help um if you've been in a car accident or a woman childbirth yeah. Um, yeah but yeah it helps so many people so you're not just helping one set of people it's helping practically everyone and you don't know you could be in a situation where you need blood yourself and if you don't yeah. give it, yeah. you probably wouldn't get yeah you are phenomenal <laughs> I swear to you oh my goodness I love I love you Maya already honestly I love your passion your energy Thank you. and the fact that you know you really want to help you can just see it that you really want to help and you really care yeah. But what, what what happens to you when you have your crisis? Can you explain what happens when you have a crisis? Well, a crisis is caused when normally your cells are meant to be round and soft and squidgy and flexible meant so that they can get through the blood vessels. But mine become sickle shaped and then they get blocked and this is cause, can, can cause swelling and pain when the blood mm-hmm. gets blocked. Um, it, it the pain varies depending on like the severity, but sometimes it feels like I'm being stabbed or being ripped apart, or my insides are being pulled out, or uh, being pushed off a cliff or wow. thrown off something. But it, it's it's like sometimes like I can't really get comfortable, but I don't want to move in a way. Sometimes, but luckily mm-hmm. recently I haven't been in hospital for like nearly two years. Which oh wow. Has been- <laughs> So the medication is working. The positive I think thinking the is working. I think it's a, 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 trying to do more positive mental attitudes and um, mindsets. But um, uh, so I, I think it's. Um, but I mean, it 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 varies. But recently, I've been really good. Yeah. Wow. It's more of a holistic approach, right? Well, we do both. So she does take medication. So she takes daily medication. She takes um, penicillin, which is to prevent infections because people with sickle cell are more prone to getting infections. Um, she also takes hydroxycarbamide, um, which increases her baby hemoglobin. So what they've found is when uh, babies are first born, up until the first six months, because they're producing this baby hemoglobin, they tend not to go into crisis. But then from about the age of seven months, when they're getting their adult blood, then the crisis start happening. So the um, hydroxycarbamide increases the um, the baby hemoglobin. So that is also working. But as Maya said, we have we have been actively trying to be more positive, saying our affirmations, um, you know, looking looking up and giving thanks, and 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 all the little things you do, like drinking water and things, and eating more of a healthy, well balanced diet, because all those things help. Amazing. Um, I'm just going to read something people have written. So I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it, Maya? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Are there genetic medicines for this condition? I guess the doctor will be able to take yeah, that yeah. question. Dr. Stephen. Yeah, I can take that on. Maya, I'm, I'm grinning and, and laughing here because you're doing such a great job with education. I love hearing this stuff. But to answer the question, so... So because sickle cell is a genetic disorder, right, the best target will probably be from the genetic standpoint. There's a lot of gene therapy going on right now. And I think, Lisa, I think you brought up a good point with the medicine she's talking about um, helps baby or fetal hemoglobin. So one of the gene therapies that is being studied now, the goal is to, you know, 
because babies, as they get older, they start producing fetal hemoglobin. With this gene therapy, the goal is to keep the babies from uh, keep the babies producing that fetal hemoglobin even right. after they're getting older, so that um, they can keep producing that um, type of hemoglobin that can transfer oxygen. So there's a lot of gene therapy happening. Some of them is actually curative, where they're actually going in and and changing those two. Um, you know, it's there's two specific genes that have been altered. So some of them are working from a gene therapy perspective, trying to fix that or correct that error. So there's a lot of research going on right now. I'm sure you guys have seen some of these that, you know, some patients have been quote unquote cured and are still being followed, but there's a lot of progress going on. We just still have a long way to go. Okay, fantastic. Doc, can you um, read this question? Yes, so please, Please recommend COA mixture for your children. And trust me, it works. So stay healthy. I don't know what they're referring to COA. Um, mm -hmm. I can think about so many different medical terms um, um, related to that. But I think overall, what's important is as far as recommendations, mostly for children, is anything that has folic acid in there is always good um, okay. because folic acid helps um, keep those red blood cells from, from dying faster. Because one, one of the facts that I think is important we should all know you know, typically for people that do not have sickle cell disease, the red blood cells last about 120 days. You know, for those with sickle cell, it's only about 10 to 20 days. So mm -hmm. for, you see a lot of people with sickle cell taking folic acid constantly to help those red blood cells uh, last longer. So I think those were along the lines of that question. And so if you can make sure your children are taking folic acid or if penicillin, like Lisa said, it's always important to keep the kids on those types of medicine. Okay. There's a next one, Doc. Have you tried the Genesis 129 diet, intermittent fasting and distilled waters? I'm a big fan of water. Look at Maya go drinking water. <laughs> I'm cute. I, I love it. I love it. So, you know, with sickle cell disease, diet, exercise, and water is like three big things, right? And so um, I think what they're referring to is the intermittent diet. Um, there's been so many different studies that have gone through that, that some people have benefited from it. I think the key takeaway here is that diet that is rich in fruits and vegetables, those are very important for people with sickle cell disease. And then also, I think one thing I forgot to mention is sleep. Sleep is very, very important to help the bodies recover. And of course, water is, is also important for sickle cells. So that's a great, great question. And thanks for bringing that up. Next one. All right, I see Kemi has a question. She says she just finished a course um, in genetics from Cambridge University and would really like to learn more about this, please. Again, I think, you know, it's the new buzz in sickle cell right now. So when you think about therapies for sickle cell, there's disease modifying therapies and there's the curative options. Um, most of the time you might hear about something called bone marrow transplant. That's another way that people can get cured. And then the gene therapy is the other option. But even here in the US now, we have three recently new approved drugs that are actually helping people with sickle cell. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, the curative options, which are usually um, the gene therapy approaches, most of them are happening in the developed countries. And for me personally, it's one of my passions to make sure that we can actually have those also on the African continent eventually too. So gene therapy, I think is gonna be the new curative approach, um, mostly here in the advanced countries and hopefully in the future, we can extend that to, to back home as well. Absolutely. And you have another one, Doc. <laughs> I see comment. This is a great question. I hear that white slash Caucasians and Asian people get sickle cell too. Is this true? Yes, it is true. It is 100% true. I know white people who... But the myth is that people always think it's a black disease. And I think Lisa you brought up a great point, right? When you're talking about blood donation, you know, sickle cell is typically stigmatized. Think it's a black disease. And so we have a lot of challenges in the black community tack on sickle cell disease, but it's important to remember that it's it can affect anybody irrespective of race or ethnicity. Let's keep in mind this. So the reason why we're seeing sickle cell around the globe is think about migration, think about slavery, and all of these contribute to that. So although sickle cell did migrate from Africa, right? There are other places in the world that people can also get sickle cell. And I can personally tell I do know some white people who do have sickle cell although it typically affects more people from the black ancestry compared to others. Mm. Next question. Someone says, the questions are coming, I love it. Is folate not better? So folate, that's a great question. So you know, I talk about folic acid, right? So if you hear the word folate, folic acid, for lack of a better term, I'm not gonna get nerdy here, they're all the same thing. 
right? So folic acid is the synthetic form of folate. So if you eat in, this is how I think about it. If you're eating foods that are rich in folic acid or folates, they're good because your body's going to break that down into folate. So think about, in general, think about foods that have greens in it, right? So think about salad, think about spinach, think about kale. All of those things typically have folate, which is the natural form of it, and it will get broken down and support your body. It's always good to supplement. I think one thing that, you know, we typically forget is, you know, for those of us that live here in the U.S. or in the U.K. or places like that, most of our foods are fortified, which is good. But unfortunately, back home, our foods are not fortified. So that's why we typically recommend folic acid addition to most of the uh, medications for people with sickle cell. But folate, folic acid, it's all the same, and they're always good for people with sickle cell disease. Okay. I think, Lisa, if you can read this one. You're on mute. Sorry about that. Okay, so this is oh, this is from the Destination Africa group. Hi guys, thank hi. you for watching. <laughs> Says hi, Maya, sickle cell advocate and mom. It's great to hear you educate the community. Thank you so much and thank you for your support. It's wonderful, like you said, one of your questions was how do your friends support you? Um, well, we're homeschoolers at the moment and the homeschool community is fantastic because yeah. they're behind us 100% and you know any kind of activities that we do they're always there and they're always cheering us on so it means a lot so thank you guys. You well, yeah. uh, Uncle Michael and Auntie Abena. but did you choose homeschooling because of what Maya was going through or was it you know a decision that you had already made? So um, I did choose to home educate Maya because she has sickle cell and um, I've heard other parents say sometimes the schools are not very understanding because children can have time off and occasionally it can become a bit of a sticky issue. But um, I also chose it because I'm self-employed and, um, and also I enjoyed spending time with my daughter. At the age of five, she was still a baby to me and I wasn't ready to kind of let her go. I enjoyed you know, kicking leaves and, and discovering things with her and, and, and still do in a way. I mean, it's a little bit harder now, but um, as she said, she starts school in September. So she's on a, a new journey. Wow. Okay. Doc, you're on mute. There we go. Okay. You guys should probably hear me now. I am old blood type, but not in the UK and a donor. Anytime I visit the UK, I don't mind to donate for this uh, future leader. I am in 100 support. And thank you, Aben Ofori, for saying that. I think, um, you know, Lisa brought up a great point. Um, I think one thing that, especially in the Black community, we're missing is encouraging and educating people to donate blood. And so quickly, you know, people might be wondering why is that important? If someone is, say, Black, and they need a, a blood donation, blood is typically typed, right? It has to match. So if you have blood that you'll be receiving from somebody who is maybe from the same ethnicity, you're more likely to get that blood with less, less risk of rejection, right? So if I can get blood from somebody who's also Black, it also actually usually helps. Unfortunately, you know, our community is not well educated enough. So you have people with sickle cell disease that need blood transfusions go in and sometimes they struggle to get that blood. So thank you for uh, volunteering to donate and blood type O, it's the universal donor type of blood. So it's always good when you can get people with blood type O um, to donate too. Um, Dr. Evan is also asking again, can I donate blood in the US and transport to the UK? Or <laughs> 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 Um, I, I'm going to say I wish you could. I think when it comes to blood donation, there's a lot of restrictions around it. You know, even for people that, let's say, were born in different countries, when you travel to a, a new country, you have to go through so many different processes just for the safety of it. You know, there's a lot of history around blood donations. I think you guys probably remember the HIV times, right, where people were just getting blood on accident, getting HIV. So there's a lot of new guidelines around it to really make sure the blood people do receive, um, they don't have any reactions to it. So it might be harder to donate blood in the U.S. and transport it, but I think under emergency situations, there can be ways around it. But thank you, at least, for donating to even help people here in the U.S. too. Absolutely. Another Question one? Coming another in. The next guest after. <laughs> All right. So, my dear, I battle with this also, but I take my medications, which helps a lot. But in my case, I have a rare blood type. 
So it's a little more difficult for me, but I manage. Um, again, I think this is more um, also to highlight the importance of blood donation, right? So, you know, universal blood donors, blood type O, there's blood type A, blood type B, blood type A and B. And, and sometimes people might have even, even a different rare form, right? Even with sickle cell, right? I think mm -hmm. Maya, you said you are SS, so we have SC, even SE, and even different rare types too. So the more people we can get in the Black community to donate blood, to learn more about sickle cell, the better it is. And unfortunately for this person here, they have a rare blood type, which makes it challenging. But hopefully that rare blood type person can be out there too that might hear this show today and go donate blood and help this person. So thanks for bringing that question. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm going to put on uh, Fatumata, who's in the US as well. Um, she's a software engineer um, and is doing, all, she also has her own bikini line as well. Um, she's an entrepreneur. Um, and I'm grateful for her coming on to share her journey living with um, sickle cell. Uh, Fatu, tell us, you know, how you have coped with living with, with sickle cell. You're on mute. Oh, hi. <laughs> so I think I'm still coping, if that makes sense. I don't think that like, like I've gotten used to it, but I feel like every time I get a crisis, it's kind of like a new, a new battle. So it's just like, okay, like how am I gonna deal with it this time? Or like, what exactly is going on in my life that like, and this, like, it's, it's, yeah, it's, I feel like every time I have a crisis, it's a new, I have to cope with it a different way and I have to deal with it a different way. I have to like change my mindset based off what's going on currently in my life. So I don't think you can ever fully get used to it. It's just kind of like a part of you. Mm. And each time something happens, it's kind of like, okay, well, what am I going to do now type of thing. Mm. Which, which type do you have? I have SS. You have SS? Yeah. Okay. And do you think that, you know, um, it has affected your social life? Has it, you know, um, did it affect maybe relationships that you were in? Um, were there times that you've got really, really depressed? Um, what has been some of the journey points um, in your life so far? So up until like recently, I didn't really speak too much about me having sickle cell. So like as a kid, I kind of kept it on the low because I didn't want to be different. I wanted to fit in with my friends. I wanted to like show them that I had the same energy. I was like, fine, there was nothing wrong. So I think that like, fortunately for me, it hasn't really affected a lot of my relationships. Like I have a good support group. My fiance is like amazing. When I'm not feeling good, he takes over. So like if I have to go to the hospital, he will take care of our dog. He will fix the house up, he will like make sure that I'm good. And with my friends, if I'm not feeling good and he's at work, they're like, they'll come and take over. They'll come and make sure that I'm okay. They'll come and make sure that I'm eating, that if I need to go use the bathroom and I can't walk, they will help me. So I am extremely fortunate to have like friends around me that are willing to like help me and be there for me. So mm -hmm. that's been good. As far as like my Mental health, I think that it has probably affected that the most because sometimes I do get like, and I do get depressed, I do get sad, I do get overwhelmed. It bothers me a lot that like, even if as much as I like try to be normal, I have to start accepting that I'm not normal and I'm not like everybody else. I don't have the same energy levels. Sometimes I don't want to go out. Sometimes I am tired and it's okay. Sometimes I like, I could go for a walk and be out of breath. I can go up a flight of steps and be out of breath. I can have a conversation and be out of breath. And that's okay. So I think mm -hmm. it's more so just accepting the fact that it's okay. Mm. Maya, what would you say to Auntie Fatu? Um, I completely agree. Completely understand what you you're going through. And yeah, I, I kind of agree. It is hard sometimes, but it's it's normal, and that I think we'll, we can definitely get through it. I mean, it it will be tricky along the road, but I mean, it will all get better in the end. 
That's very, very good encouragement. And, uh, and I know that um, Maya has to go, um, but before you go to any young girl who might be watching that does have sickle cell and are feeling really low um, and don't understand why they, they have to go through this. Why is it that, why is it them and not anybody else? You know, sometimes you start to question yourself and start to question your family. Why, why is it just me that's going through this and nobody else? What would your advice be to them? You're not alone. You can get through this. Don't blame yourself. You'll be okay. Keep rising. I know it's really, really hard sometimes, but you, you'll be okay. You'll be fine. Just keep doing what you do and keep keep carrying on. Don't give up. Bless you. God bless you. I mean, you're <laughs> um, wow. God bless you, Maya. You are She's honestly. Amazing. Yes, and you've encouraged Fatu. She's emotional now as well. But Ooh, very your words. By the way. <laughs> Maya, Maya, before you go, I want to say something quickly. So one of my favorite quotes, I always say that if you ever want inspiration, look no further. Just find someone with sickle cell disease. And I think that um, this just exemplifies it. So thank you, Maya. I'm a big fan. I just wrote down your handle and, and fat to as well. And I'm going to be in touch and hopefully we can keep this going. But you guys are true inspiration. And it's what really keeps keeps me doing what I'm doing. And I'm sure everybody is inspired by what you said, too. Thank Absolutely. You. And Molly, do you have any last words um, before you go as well? Um, I think um, parents of children with sickle cell as well need need support. And there um, there's ways of, you know, you can set up WhatsApp groups or Facebook groups and we can communicate with each other because it can be hard or it is hard, not can be hard. It is hard watching your child suffer. There's, there's a lot of um, mental stuff that we go through as well, knowing that we are the ones that are responsible for our children's pain. But know that there is support out there for you as well. Know that there's people that you can talk to. Um, and, and, and it's, you know, you don't just always have to be the strong one. Make sure there's somebody there that can encourage you and support you and help you to be strong. And, um, and, and, be open with your child, be open and honest so you can have these conversations and so that your child can come to you whenever they're feeling depressed or sad or afraid, let them know that they can come to you. And just thank you. Thank you for all the people yeah. that donate blood. Thank you so much for doing that because Maya's had six blood transfusions and I don't know, I don't know. I don't know where... where where we would be if these people, these, they just give blood. They, they, they do it out of the kindness of their hearts, complete strangers. And um, it means a lot, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm, I'm sending virtual hugs, um, virtual hugs. Can you feel the hug? Can yes, you thank, thank you, thank you. And thank you to everyone that's also you know, <laughs> commenting and been watching as well. Thank you so much, it means a lot. Uh, yeah, and shout out to um, Kids Big News as well. Thank you so much. Yay! <laughs> yes. Um, because of them, I saw you. I was like, what? I need to have yeah. my on my show. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Have a lovely evening and um, we'll speak soon. God bless Thank you. you. Thank Take you. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you for having us. Bye-bye. Bye. Oh, okay. Um, next up, Emmanuel. Um, Emmanuel works for the NHS. Um, he also has sickle cell. Emmanuel, how is it like um, as a man? You know, I think it, it, we go through a different, diff a different type of thing as well. Because you know, when you're in pain, are you supposed to show it? You know, when you're going through your crisis and all of these type of things, I think what you guys have to go through is something different as well. How have you been able to cope with your sickle cell? Um, I think. I think the thing with sickle cell is you you kind of just have to get on with it, you know. Um, there's not really a manual and it's 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 kind of a learn on the job sort of thing. And um as a, a man with sickle cell, I guess you have to 
it's a struggle that you know um you kind of have to find your own path for myself personally i was in a lot of denial until i reached 21. um that's when my sickle cell really had a, a chokehold on me and um that that was for me the beginning of a very different chapter in my life as far as my sickle cell was concerned but prior to that i didn't really used to let it affect me too much and you know it really did take me having to mentally address it as well as physically and and coming to terms with that a lot and also speaking with other men and just you know being more vocal generally because it meant that i was able to deal with it better mm. And did you find that, you know, vocally more, your friends were able to understand more of what you were going through? I'd, I'd say yes and no, um, simply because there's only so much that you can help people to understand. And, you know, sometimes until people see it for themselves, then they don't really understand. And, you know, I'm, I'm six foot three, so I'm quite a big guy. But, you know, when I have a sickle cell crisis, I'm like a child you know mm. i can't do much for myself and so for the people that are you know near and dear to me i think seeing me in that crippling state and understanding that you know the independence is not there and you know the vulnerability is there it really helps them to understand how much this thing does affect me yeah and do you think that i mean you would think that everybody would know what sickle cell is right but do you think that our community are still blasé to it? Do you think that they still don't get it? They still don't understand it? And, you know, how do we get them to understand what sickle cell really is? I think shock therapy is what's needed, in short. You know, um, in the last 12 months, me personally, I've, I've lost a few people that I know to sickle cell. And, you know, people are constantly dying from sickle cell. And um, I think until there is that realization and conversations like this are happening, it's, it's always gonna be like an uphill struggle. The problem that we have in our community is it's not being spoken about. And ultimately, <clears throat> excuse me, ultimately around the world, if we're honest, because it's, you know, a, a disease that affects the black community predominantly, it's not given the attention and resources um, that is that are necessary in order to to make the change worldwide that is needed. So, you know, it's it falls on people like us who live with sickle cell um, and, you know, doctors who are practicing. And, and this is the difference with doctors who, you know, um, are practicing, you know, in hematology, they they have to have a passion, you know, and the the passion becomes prevalent. And without the passion, sickle cell just remains the same. And and it is honestly, you know, the difference between life and death for some of us. So yeah, yeah, and you're absolutely right. And I I, I was saying to um uh, Maya and her mom before we went live that I'm I'm a pediatric nurse by profession, so I've seen a lot of sickle cell children um, coming to the hospital. And I remember as a student nurse, there was this one girl that kept on coming in with sickle cell crisis um, and would say that she is in pain, like the painkillers that we're given is not doing anything. But there's, it's like they didn't believe her that she was in yeah, pain. Yeah. And they, they were just like, no, she can't be in pain because she can't be in that much pain. No, no. We've just given her, you know, paracetamol. She's like, paracetamol can't touch this. Like, I'm in so much pain and i feel like even us healthcare professionals mm -hmm. still don't kind of get it because it's like this person is in pain you can see that they're in pain but you think that they're lying um you know doc have you have you come across this as well unfortunately emmanuel is right um you know one of the things that i'm not shy to talk about is those of us in the healthcare community can do a lot better yeah. And I'll take it even a, a step further. You know, I think one of the things that, especially this past year, um, a lot of um, inequities have been brought up to light, right? And so if you take sickle cell, one of the things that I always say is everything that's going on around the world, it's nothing new to the sickle cell community. It's just been brought up to light even further. And if you take healthcare in particular, one, like Emmanuel said, this disease disproportionately affects Black people. It doesn't help. So, you know, I have so many patients that will reach out and say, hey, I'm in the ER and the doctors are not attending to me. And I think it's because, one, the way that we are educated as healthcare providers, it's not the best. 
And why do I say that? Because for most people, whether you're going to medical school, nursing school, pharmacy school, you probably spend one day or even one page chapter learning about sickle cell disease. And so when people are left to go to the hospitals to now care for this disease that is affecting people that need help, they just have to use their internal bias to make those decisions. And that's what's really happening. And so to Emmanuel's point, if people are not passionate about the disease, they don't care as much. So I think a lot of the work that we have to do is one, let's get back to the basics, right? Let's talk about sickle cell and educate the upcoming providers now, help them understand what this disease really is. What does it mean for a patient coming in that maybe the amount of medicine you gave is it's not suboptimal, it's not working anymore. And you have to believe them versus maybe thinking that it's not real. One last thing I would say to you in terms of the healthcare environment is one of the challenges with sickle cell, you know, think about pain, right? Pain, unfortunately, is very subjective. There's really no marker. You know, if someone came in and said, hey, I have an infection, you know, we can do different tests. I can do a pulmonary test, figure out is this truly a pulmonary infection or anything but pain? You really have to believe what that person is saying in the mm -hmm. first place. And unfortunately, the black community, you know, there's a study I remember that was very popular around that looked at study doctors and and the study, lack for lack of better term, concluded that most healthcare providers in that study concluded that they think people with black people, with people with black skin, were, were have higher pain tolerance compared to those who were who are white, right? So that's kind of those inequities you see in healthcare. And I think we just have to remind everybody in healthcare that we can always do better. And we have to listen to the patient because quite quite honestly, the patients know better than all of us healthcare providers. So that's that's what I would say. And I agree with you, Emmanuel. Yeah, oh, it's, 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 it's difficult. Um, I wanna go to Gifty. Gifty, thank you so much for joining us and being patient on the line as well. I know that you have you have three sisters with sickle cell? Yeah. I'm so filled Tell up now. I don't know. Um, oh. It's a bit hard and I don't even know where to start from. I know it's been, it's been a difficult journey, but tell us, tell us what you have been through living with, with, with sickle cell. So three of my sisters, as in three of them had sickle cell. And um, the, the, the other one, I mean, one of them didn't know she had sickle cell till she was about 40 when she was trying to conceive. Wow. And that was where, yeah, that was where everything got a little bit complicated for him, uh, for her because then she tried so many ways and she had to go through IVF. And then they said to her that, sorry, because you are SS, you can't go through that. And that is where the genesis of her, if I should say, problem started. So somewhere down the line, she had a kidney infection, a kidney failure as well. And uh, she was just told point blank that she would not get a transplant from anywhere because of her situation. So her crisis actually started from the age of 40. And she has been in constant pain. Someone daily trying to deal with the crisis, trying to deal with uh, kidney failure, and she's on dialysis. She's actually drained. So that is Esther. So she had to stop work because then she couldn't cope at work. Uh, she had, she had so many. I mean, at the moment, I'm actually stepping in for her. The two sisters I had, I'm sorry, they, they, are, they, they are not with me anymore. The first one died at the age of 40, the second one at the age of 43. Oh. So I'm just left with one who is actually battling. And uh, I don't know, it, it's, it's, it's actually too, too much for me at the moment. I don't know how I'm gonna cough out my words, but I just felt like I should just, I should just join to, to share the little bit I have because something about sickle cell is something that most of the black community would not talk about. And for my sister at the age of 40, who is actually battling kidney failure and to be told straightforward that she can't have a transplant. So she has to live with it and till, that, till whenever she has to go, she will go. 
it's 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 really really terrible so four girls three and i'm the only one standing just by the grace of god and um i don't know doc any anything to say to what gifty is going through um, I, I think the first thing I would say is, you know, um, I think everybody on here would say we all um, are encouraged by everything you're sharing. I think, you know, you can always say we cannot, we can only imagine your pain. Um, but I think one thing that give to you said that really stood out to me is that, you know, sister didn't find out much about her disease until 40. And, and to somebody, that's a shocker, right? Why is that happening? But but I'm sorry to say, share that that's not isolated. That happens so often, right? And I think I, I talked about earlier, you know, at Sickle Salon, we run these studies. And, and like I said, we found out more than 50% of people I find out they have sickle cell trait, even after they have a child born with sickle cell, brings family disputes. You know, husbands think, oh, you lied to me. It must not be my kid because they were not tested for it. That's one big part of it. The second part is now, you know, someone who has a kidney complication, they're not putting her on the transplant list. And I know why they're doing that, because, you know, they do all the risk assessments and figure out for such a person, how long are they going to last getting a new kidney, right? It talks about all the inequities that people with sickle cell have to face. So let's use that as a bucket. And imagine having sickle cell and also being black. That's a double whammy. And so, unfortunately, you know, when I hear these stories, it's it's like a deja vu. I've, I've heard these stories over and over. And I think, you know, there has to be a time where we have to start telling our own stories. You know, I don't have sickle cell, but I'm passionate about it because I have a sister. You know, Gifty is on you talking about it. I think this is where we start. And, and hopefully the future generation will get to a point where even people who have sickle cell, it can be managed that they don't have to go through all of these things. So, so Gifty, I'm sorry to really hear about a lot of these things, but I think we have our work cut out for us. And in the time, I think what you're doing is great. And this is a first step to making sure we don't have to hear more of these even in the future. Absolutely. And we're sending you a virtual hug as well, Gifty. We're sending you all of us to send you a virtual hug. Um, but going back to your to your sisters, how often were they having crisis, and what what type of sickle cell did they have? BSSS. Okay. So the two actually had their crisis from childbirth. I mean, from the very beginning. So I knew that the two of them had it. So from say, you, you can imagine having two sisters who both of them are in crisis at the same time. I'm the youngest and they are, I mean, the two of them were there. So I'm actually sitting down at night, seeing my mom struggling to deal with two, two kids at the same time. And then there are times that you had to, we, we, we used to live in Ghana, we had to go to Kolebu for transplant and uh, uh, transfusion for blood transfusion because then, um, then we actually referred to, we had, we had, they had a doctor, Dr. Chumesi, he, he, he was their doctor, but then there are times you hear her, him telling them that, oh, I'm sorry, um, Madam, this support the whole last long. Why are you wasting your time? And my mom keeps, <laughs> Bless her. She's actually being told in the face not to waste her time because these kids are going to die anytime soon. Oh. But then they were able to, yeah, yeah, yeah. And knowing <laughs> Ghana with sickle cell, having a blood transfusion, it, it it's another ball game altogether. It's terrible. Because you go into the ward and you see everybody else is just moaning and crying and everyone is in pain. So you can't come with the pain, with a, with a child who is actually going through pain and you're thinking they should take care of yours and leave these ones. No, everybody else needs to be attended to. So you can be in pain for like hours before they put the drip on you. What can you do? But God being so good, they will actually... Late, they survived to the age of 40 there about before before going so mm. living with them i felt like <sighs> I don't know. Difficult. too much pain to watch it's too yeah. much to watch a, a loved one going through such pains every day 
So, so what happened to me was I was actually going into a boarding school. They just pushed me into a boarding school not to witness all that. But every wow. time I come home, they are still there in pain, crying, and um, you do everything and everything for them. But this this pain actually goes down when it feels like going down. Hmm. Okay. And yeah. do you think that it was it was like? Say in a year, how many times would, would they go through a crisis? Oh, it's countless times. Wow. It is countless. Or they, they, they don't have to do anything strenuous, nothing stressful for them. They have to be like in a relaxed situation. They take all the medications they are taking, but hey, when it kicks in, there's nothing else you can do about it. <sighs> May their soul rest in peace. And thank you for being a strong sister. And even, you know, you coming on, sharing this story is, is very powerful um, for people out there to really understand what, you know, people go through. And um, I always say that sometimes we see people um, and we don't know what people are going through. You know, we don't know the situations that people are going through. And I'm going to come to Emmanuel and Fatou. Um, is it hard getting a stable job? Because again, if you're going to be having crisis, like how are they dealing with you? How are they understanding you when it when it comes to having crisis? I'll start with Emmanuel. Um, you, <laughs> you'll notice that we both laughed at your question um, because. Yeah it's 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 like the biggest uphill struggle you have to and this is half the problem that we face in life you have to demonstrate that you're in excruciating pain whilst looking normal and it's one of the biggest struggles that we face in life i remember i had to fill in a job application and it, it got to a health questionnaire in it and it said have you been admitted well i had actually got the job and it said, uh, have you been admitted into hospital in the last two years? And I just started laughing. And then it left the space for five entries. And at the time, I had been admitted into hospital over the last two years, more than 20 times. And I just sat there and I laughed to myself. And I thought to myself, do you know what? Let's just roll with the punches and see what happens. But um, I've definitely, you know, been dismissed from jobs for absence because you have this thing where nobody believes you. And, you know, you have to go to extremities of calling ambulances to work because if you don't do that, people won't believe you. I've literally, you know, um, had to take pictures of myself on an ECG machine um, I've had to take pictures of myself in hospital to send to people um, at work because they just don't believe you because, you know, one minute you're seemingly okay and the next minute you're not. And um, just going back to what, what Gifty was saying as well, and it's, it's really important, um, no two people with sickle cell are the same and we all suffer individually. Although we may be SS or SC or beta thalassemia or what have you, we all suffer differently. And, you know, that is one of our biggest struggles as well. Again, going back to what um, Dr. Stephen was saying with regards to when we report at ER or A&E, our biggest problem is, you know, trying to communicate what's going on with us. Not so much because it's, it's difficult, but because no two people are the same. So whilst one person can come in with, <clears throat> excuse me, whilst one person can come in with, um, you know, they might be having a crisis in their shoulder. I could come in and I could be presenting with a crisis in my foot and the pain may be extreme in one and not so extreme in the other, you know, but the, the, the levels of experience are definitely the same. And, um, you know, what, what I do is, I try to highlight that. So I have an Instagram page called Wants UK, um, and Wants is an acronym for We Are Not the Same, and it's literally to highlight the differences in everybody that suffers with sickle cell. Because you do have, you know, people that will go through twenty years without a crisis, and people that can't go two weeks without a crisis, and people that can stay in crisis for six months. You know, um, and so it's really, really important 
that discussions like this are happening. So thank you, Denta, for this and and Gifty, just be encouraged, um, you know, and, and thank you for, for sharing your story. And it needs to be heard more because the more people hear it, the more people react and the more change can happen. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Um, Fatou, do you have anything to add to the question that I asked? Everything Emmanuel said is true. First of all, it's extremely hard to keep a job with sickle cell which is one of the reasons I wanted to become a software engineer because it's a work from home job and I could bring my laptop to the hospital if I get sick and I could, it's like, I'll call out less, but I've definitely had to be more dramatic with my crisis to convince like my managers at work that I am sick or I've had to like literally probably call them mid crisis while I'm crying so they can see that like, I'm not faking or I'm not like lying or I do feel sick or like even sometimes with like old friends, when I say I'm tired, they'll not believe me because I look fine, because I look healthy, because I'm like always laughing or because I'm just like joking around most of the time. Nobody believes that I'm actually sick or nobody believes that like my sickness is as bad as I claim to like claim to be or yeah, it's just a, a lot more convincing, a lot more like acting, a lot more. And most of the time, it's not even acting. Like when you have a crisis, it's bad. When you're sick, it's bad. But people don't believe you can be as sick as much as you are. Or people don't believe that you can feel that much pain when one minute you're like smiling and joking around. I remember um, I was having, I was, I closed a car door. Um, I was leaving the supermarket with my fiance. I closed the car door and because I closed it too hard, I hurt my arm and that started a crisis. And within like the next 30 minutes, my whole body was hurting and I had to go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And people don't understand that. Like it could literally go from zero to a hundred in a matter of minutes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I definitely agree with everything everyone else said. And it's definitely a struggle. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Doc, um, what makes, what happens to somebody that has sickle cell that get, it gets so bad that they can pass away? What are some of the things that happen to your body when a crisis or so is happening? It's a great question. Um, you know, I think and I say this not to put fear in people, but to understand the reality of it. So, you know, for so long, what we typically say is people with sickle cell are not supposed to live longer. And I think I think it was gifted that talked about the doctors telling the mom not to waste their time, right? And unfortunately, it's very common that doctors say that because they don't understand how to manage these patients. So I say all of that to say that when you think about sickle cell, the way that I like to describe it is, it is a multi-organ disease. So think about any organ in the body, a sickle cell crisis or sickle cells can get over there because at the end of the day, that's how we get oxygen to all our tissues. And so I think the biggest ones usually is the pain crisis or the visual occlusive crisis, which we tend to hear very often. And so when patients go in and providers are not taking care of them really well, I think one thing that we need to remember is pain can put people in shock. And you put someone in shock, it's hard to get them back. The other thing is infection. Infection is a big one. And, and I'm sure everybody on here can talk about it. But again, you know, especially, you know, I always like to bring it back to Africa and back home. Um, you know, for people with sickle cell, you might be wondering why is that? Because so for people with sickle cell, the immune system isn't as strong. And one of the things that personally, um, personally, I hate saying this, I hate saying sickle cell patients. I like to say individuals living with sickle cell disease because they're more than sickle cell. But one thing that's important is with sickle cell, they don't have a strong immune system. So one of the big things with our whole body is the spleen, right? So the spleen is one of the parts of the immune system that really helps fight infections. Unfortunately, with sickle cell, as they get older, there's something called asplenia, where the spleen pretty much will just die. Or sometimes, you know, I've seen this on on imaging where someone with sickle cell in a period of two years, you look on, on the imaging again and the spleen is no longer there. So that's why you see sickle cell patients taking penicillin to help with that. But again, if they get an infection and sometimes a more severe case called acute chest syndrome, 
uh, usually a pulmonary related one. It's it's really really hard, and if they are not well taken care of, it can result in death. Because if you think about it, in order for your body to recover from any anything, whether it's an infection or anything, your immune system has to support. You know, it's a disease that the immune system isn't the same as everybody else. And so if they're not well taken care of, that can happen. Um, I could go on and on. You know, there's something called avascular necrosis that has to do with the bone. Um, strokes, uh, people typically forget about that. Think about strokes, think about blood. You know, I've seen, unfortunately, people with sickle cell that live with permanent strokes and all of those things can actually cause death. And mm -hmm. so there's so many, you know, any part of the body that you can think of, people with sickle cell can have a crisis from there or can have a complication from there. And all of those things, even though well taken care of, unfortunately can lead to, to death. Okay. Um, is herbal and traditional medicine, does it work? African herbal medicine, somebody's asked. It's a great question. Um, you know, so my background is in pharmacology. So, so I'm a big nerd on that. This is what I always like to tell people. Every medicine that we use now started as a herbal medicine, right? So all medicines come from plants. You know, they can be made from a synthetic standpoint of all of these things. Um, you know, for my foundation, one of the things that we try to do is really help sickle cell patients get their routine medicines for free. And a lot of the time, those that we help in Nigeria and Ghana, most of them are coming to us, hey, how about this herbal medicine? My always go-to is the challenge with herbal medicine is you don't know how much you're taking. So, so think about it this way. It's like water to me. You know, water is a great thing that we all need, but too much of it can be bad. And, and I think one thing that we can do, especially on the African continent, is spend more time understanding our herbal products better. So I think there's some benefits to it, but we don't spend time understanding, am I giving too much or too little? And I've seen people with sickle cell that say, the only thing I take is my herbal medicine and it works for me. Great. But unfortunately, some others will take a herbal medicine, they might overdo it, and you can't really tell what's really causing it, and that can lead to, to death. So most of the time, my go-to is, if you're taking a herbal medicine, really make sure you're talking to your doctor about it. If you ever have to get hospitalized for sickle cell when you go there, tell them. Tell them you're taking herbal medicine. Then people forget. Uh, those of us in the healthcare standpoint, I can actually look at your herbal medicine and tell you if it's going to interact with your regular medicine. I think people forget about that. So I think there's some benefit to it. We just need to do more research and, and help understand all of those herbal uh, medications a little bit better. Fantastic. We're gonna go through a screen of questions and comments and stuff. So Kemi has one. I see it, I see. Kemi, I think your question is more around funding and research. And I think, I think we can all agree. The only way we drive change in sickles or any disease is funded. Unfortunately, you know, I always tell people, I'm going to talk about it as a race issue until you prove to me it's not. You know, one of the things that we do at Sickle Cell 101, we, we have a research platform now that really helps sickle cell patients identify ongoing research easily. I'm sure most of you here can agree. If you go read a lot of research going on for sickle cell, too scientific, you know, I can read it and get ex excited about it, but most patients don't get it. And so what we tend to see, and, and I will use cystic fibrosis as an example. Sickle cell is the first molecular disorder that was found. Cystic fibrosis has almost five times as many medicines as sickle cell disease. Why is that? Because of funding. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have funding, you don't have change. And, you know, not up until 2019 that we got three more medicines before that. And so I think funding plays a big role. And, and we, you know, especially on the African continent, unfortunately, we mostly have to wait for people to help us. I think we need to start changing that narrative with the little that we have, you know, how do we make sure that we are diversifying funding, not just for, let's say, one specific disease alone. We're also paying attention to sickle cell disease or helping them get medicine for free. You know, I have a partner in Ghana who are telling me, and I don't know much about the national health insurance in Ghana compared to here, but they were telling me that they put a new sickle cell medicine on there and they're thinking about taking it off of it. And I have some friends in the Ministry of wow. Health that to them, and I always try to tell them, this is what we're talking about with sickle cell. If you take that away, that has to do with funding. Because if we cannot prove that this medicine is helping people with sickle cell, we cannot validate pulling funding over there. So I think it's a big topic that we need to invest in the sickle cell community. Most of us in developed countries have seen it, but in Africa, it's like four or five times more. And hopefully in the future, we can get more. And I challenge all the pharmaceutical companies that I work with here in the US, I tell them, you guys really want to change sickle cell? Go back to the roots. 
And where is the root? It's in Africa. That's really where research and, and funding has to start from, too. So we have a long way to go with funding and research. And it's one of my most passionate yeah. topics to, to talk about. Yeah. And I think you're right. I mean, I just I don't even want to think about what is happening in in Ghana or Africa when it comes to sickle cell, like Gifty was explaining, um, and even the cost to a family, you know, when it comes to the medications. Um, at least in the UK, you know that you can get it, but you know, um, it must be really, really expensive for somebody in Ghana. How 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 expensive was it, um, Gifty? With your with your sisters battling um, sickle cell in hospitals, um, my mom used to work at Barclays, so sometimes she gets she she gets some of them, some okay. of them off. I think from work, what to do okay. with? But aside that, the other med the other medications she has to pay for, or when she has to go through the private. Yeah. The private side, I mean, she has to pay for it. So being little, as at that age, I wouldn't know much. Okay. And then as as and when they grew up, they got married and were taking care of themselves, then it looks like they, they had to sort of like deal with it. So yeah. okay. the fact that okay. they go to hospital every day, you put blood transfusion, that should tell you a lot of that. It would cost you a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Um. Sheila says, it's shocking to know of sickle cell at age 40. I have been a sickle cell trait since childhood and I knew it from childbirth. Um, again, that's what um, I think doctor was saying at the beginning, like, you know, usually there's a heel prick, right? When a child is born and you, you kind of know if the child has it, but I don't even know whether in Ghana these things are happening or in parts of Africa. Yeah, it's happening in Ghana now. We're starting okay. to do it. Um, we have a great partner, the Sickle Cell Foundation of Ghana. They're actually helping with that newborn screening. And, and so you're starting to see it being adopted in most of the hospitals. Um, you know, one of the things that I will add to that, and give you brought up a great point, you know, for me, I always tell my sister this. Uh, she, she has Sickle Cell. She inspires me a lot. But I always tell her she's lucky. Why do I say that? You know, quick example. Back in December, my sister gets admitted to the hospital. And, and access is all what this happens, right? So I know a lot of doctors in Ghana. I know a lot of leaders in the sickle cell space. I was able to call these people and have her taken care of. One thing I told her to do was take pictures. Tell me more about these conversations happening. And it was fascinating. So talking about these medicine costs, all of it, to us, it's nothing. But it was fascinating to see that, you know, I had to call a friend I know who's a lead doctor at Confanochi to go to a hospital and now the treatment changed. And my question I kept asking myself is, what happens to the sickle cell patient that doesn't have it? Doesn't know anybody. <laughs> what happens to them? They die. And, and that's why we see all these big numbers. So I think to your point, a lot of us that are passionate about this, especially in Ghana, is helping with newborn screening. And, and I am um, Dr. One of my great friends, Dr. Ophine Frimpon, they're doing such a great work with that. But there's still so much work to be done. And, and hopefully we can get to a point where, and I always say, if we can target people in the universities and even high school to learn more about sickle cell trait, sickle cell disease, uh, we can start changing that narrative and hopefully newborns can know about it. I think a mother coming in the hospital, you know, here in the U.S., you get a letter. But in Ghana, most of them, they, they just get told and, and that's it. And, and that's it. And they probably don't even remember. You know, she has so much going on. Like I think Gifty said about it. Parents have to figure out giving the kid food giving them clothing, taking them to school. Now you added a sickle cell. They probably don't care until something bad happens. But hopefully we can get to a point where every child who's born can get tested. And the machines that test, that's another challenge. And and hopefully we can get to a point where we get the correct testing too. Absolutely. Uh, Fatu, when did you find out you had sickle cell and who told you? You're on mute. Sorry, my mother find out, found out when I was three months old. Okay. And I think it's because um, my body parts were getting swollen mm -hmm. and I was crying a lot. So she went and got me tested and then they told her I had sickle cell. So I've kind of known since I was a kid because I was always in and out of the hospital. Okay. So it kind of became like a second home. I got to the point where I like knew all the nurses. I actually used to get excited to go because I would go to the playroom and I would get to like do arts and crafts. So it was just kind of like second nature. 
Mm, mm, mm. Emmanuel, when did you when did you find out and who told you? So um, my parents got to know when I was 18 months. I went to the child mind uh, and I just wouldn't stand up. I was crying and I wouldn't stand up. And they took me to the hospital and they said to them, it's probably an infection, sent me home. And I still wasn't standing up. And so, you know, my parents being my parents, you know, they said they know their child. So they took me back and uh, they saw a different doctor, ran some blood tests. And that's when it came back that I had sickle cell. Wow. 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 So, so Doc, can you, can you outline some of the um, um, sickle cell symptoms that one, one might come come across that you might not think you might think oh they're playing up or you know um, you don't know yeah. you know what what's happening to your child what are some of the symptoms that um, um, people might be going through um, to to know that they've got sickle cell I think the first one is um, what Fatu alluded to right so a lot of the time when the kids are born. Um, the parents don't know, and especially if they haven't had that newborn um, screening done. And there's something called dactylitis. And so that's where the kids start having those swelling hands and swelling feet. And so, in fact, to your point, most parents will find out then. And what's, what's really happening there is, like we talked about earlier, the fetal hemoglobin that the kids have, that's really normal hemoglobin because it can produce, um, um, transport oxygen correctly. It's normal for the kids, but as they start to grow a little bit older, that fetal hemoglobin drops, and then your normal hemoglobin starts picking up. But unfortunately, sickle cell is it's a sickle hemoglobin, so that's where you start to see those swelling, and the kids are crying a lot. So those are the big um, things that parents are going to see super early. Um, the other one is infections that do not go away, and so you know I'm sure probably a lot of you on this call can allude to this. A lot of the time, you know, for me maybe a small cut that might take me. A day or two for you know a scab to form or a skin um, healing to happen it's not happening in sickle cell that fast and so they might take a little bit longer because wound healing has to do with red blood cells transporting oxygen um the other one is is one that we typically don't hear a lot about leg ulcers it's, it's a big one and so you tend to see for especially for those that are in communities that maybe they're not um in, in good hygiene or health it's, it's a big one that can you see very often and their legs will develop these ulcers that never, never heal. Um, the last one I want to talk about is probably one that's so obvious to us, but we never think about it. So for those that are in Africa or place like that, malaria is a big one. So for those with sickle cell, when, when they get malaria, they experience the worst side of it. And so a lot of parents, you know, if you have a little born, they don't know they have sickle cell disease. When they start to see their kids have malaria and it's really going untreated and the kids are having worse fevers over and over it might be a good cardinal sign and you know the other ones you know think about i think i talked about the strokes a lot i talked about the infections a lot but i think primarily dactylitis is a big one parents should watch out for you see your kids swelling hands swollen feet you definitely have to be um cautious about that okay doc there's a question on there for you what about sickle cell disease is it as bad as ss or no Oh, sickle cell SC, is it as bad as SS or no? And what can a parent who are married and don't want to divorce do to prevent their children from sickle cell? Okay, this is, this is, this is what I always say. The goal of sickle cell education is to help parents make an informed decision about childbirth. That's, that's where I always want to go with that. And so why do I say that? You know, if, if unfortunately parents have already fallen in love and now they're like, oh, we're going to have kids already. I think they have to face the facts. If you both have sickle cell trait, remember every 25, every child you have 25% chance the child's gonna have sickle cell disease. I think you owe it to your child to sit and evaluate. Do I have the resource to take care of this kid? Do I have the capabilities? Where I live, are there being transformative treatments that I can put my child into? If not, I think you might wanna err on the side of caution. The other thing I, I would also say too is they ask a question about SC and SS. And in the sickle cell community, you know, I think most of you on, on here talk about having SS. That's something that people with SS typically have worse symptoms. But Emmanuel brought up a good point. We are all not the same. Mm -hmm. I've seen people with SS that only go to the hospital once. My sister is, has SS. She goes in once or twice. And I've seen people with SC that go in so many times. Sickle cell is so fascinating. You know, I dig into so much research and 
sometimes people with sickle cell disease SS, if they have a thalassemia trait too, they actually have a less symptoms um, related to sickle cell. So it does vary with symptoms. I think the general, again, I always tell my research colleagues, whenever you see sickle cell research being done, it's mostly for people with SS. And then we try and extrapolate that for people with SC. But I think when they have SS or SC, symptoms can vary. And it doesn't matter which one you have. I think we just have to re remind ourselves that anybody with sickle cell disease in general can have complications. Yeah. Can we access penicillin for free in Ghana? That's my hope. So, okay, so, hopefully, so not, not now. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully the entire I hope, you know, like I said, I work a lot of these different medical colleagues. But in the future... We can get all these different leaders on board, you know, people opening hospitals and pharmacies and and help get these medicines for free for these patients. For now, for the patients that have sickle cell enrolled in our program for my foundation, they do get those medicines for free. But in the country, in general, people have to pay for it. You know, to us, two dollars is cheap. But it's, it's two dollars is, is not is not cheap to somebody in Ghana. And that's what we try to we try to change. So hopefully in the future we can get to that point and my goal is to pull more researchers and funders here from the U.S. and the U.K. to help sponsor those so that sickle cell patients don't even have to think about these medicines that they deserve. It's, it's, it's something that they just deserve. So let's let's knock on wood and hopefully we can get to that point. OK, another one for you, Doc. I'm from Nigeria and I'm very, very interested. I'm very, very interested in a woman with sickle cell and pregnancy. Prenatal vitamins with that iron are difficult and you are stuck with just your folic acid, what is your advice? So you guys are probably wondering what this person is getting at. So one of the things about sickle cell that is important to know is, you know, we talk about sickle cell patients having to go for blood transfusions, right? One of the risks with blood transfusions is you can get something called iron overload because it's something that comes with getting blood. So sometimes, you know, they will put on iron chelation therapy so that that doesn't happen. Because if you get too much iron in your body, that can actually be bad for you and, and even, you know, cause blockade in, in different parts of the body. So this person's question, I think they're talking about the fact that the woman has sickle cell is pregnant. And of course, with prenatal vitamins, you want to have iron in it. And unfortunately, if you take those with too much iron, it can be harmful. My advice is focus on foods with iron. So if you're getting the iron from food, your body can break that down a little bit easier. And, and my go-to always is think about, so there's these vitamins that we call the water-soluble vitamins, right? So any food you take, and I'll give you guys that knowledge. There's something called ADEK ADEK. So any vitamin that's ADEK, your body cannot break those down as, as fast. So vitamin C, you can take as much vitamin C as you want. Once your body's done, it will get rid of it. So iron is one of those that is challenging to get rid of. So I always like to resort to food versus okay. taking it as a, as a vitamin if it's someone with sickle cell disease. Okay. Next one. Can you talk about AC, please? It's a new one for me. Well, it's not new for me. So, so <laughs> AC, AC, what that they're referring to in general is sickle cell trait. So, you know, in general, we talk about sickle cell being SS. And so for someone who has sickle cell trait, they just have one copy of their gene. That's going to be hemoglobin A, which is the normal one, and then hemoglobin S, right? But remember, some people can have sickle cell SC. So somebody can have a normal hemoglobin A and have a C, which means they have sickle cell trait. So for such people, unfortunately, this is, I think this is so important. Unfortunately, people with AC, they typically, the tests that are typically done sometimes don't find it. And so if you have someone with AC who has sickle cell trait, that possibly don't even know. If they were to have a child with somebody who also has, let's say, AS, because they probably think their AC is normal, they're going to have a child who might have sickle cell disease because the child can have SC, which is also sickle cell disease. So AC isn't talked about very often, but it's another form of sickle cell trait that people need to get tested and found out with the correct testing. A lot of testing will give you false results. Okay. I think this question is for Emmanuel because Gifty in, in, is in Ghana. Um, do you think that NHS are doing enough to tackle um, sickle cell? No. Quite simply. Um, I So going back to um, when we were talking about medicine, so up until the age of 18. So when you finish full-time education in the UK, you have to pay for your medicine up until the age of, um, you know, 65, I believe. Um, in terms of awareness, and I think, uh, you know, you spoke on it before, the education is not there, even for healthcare professionals. 
I'm in touch with a lot of healthcare professionals, uh, doctors and nurses. And for nurses, sometimes it's half a page in a book. And for doctors, it's maybe three or four pages. And it's probably covered in about half a day. Um, you know, myself, I've been to A&E and I've had to verbally, um, you know, fight doctors because, you know, I know my protocol. And one thing that, you know, um, sickle cell worries have to do is be informed because, you know, you do get, unfortunately, doctors who they, they do the reading and they think that it's a one size fits all kind of treatment. So what they do is they approach every patient with that. And I had a doctor one time who told me that I didn't need any fluids. He told me I didn't need any oxygen and he refused to give it to me. And I was telling him, you know, I know my protocol for one and for two, I've been in the hospital my whole life and I'd never seen him before. So I was saying respectfully, whatever you're saying is nonsense. And I need another opinion or another doctor to come and treat me because you're going to be a hindrance rather than a help. So, yeah, definitely not. So you're constantly fighting. Yeah, all the time, all the time. Um, I mean, it's it's only, you know, when you come across doctors like Dr. Stephen, for example, that, you know, they are a help rather than a hindrance. And, um, you know, like my, I have to give a, a special shout out to uh, Linda Sawyer. She is the sickle cell nurse, well, pediatric sickle cell nurse in Croydon now. But um, she literally saved my life 13 years ago. Um, if not for this woman, I would have died. And, you know, it's the attention to detail and the diligence that people like her take in doing their job that is making a difference in our community. Wow. We're going to wrap up soon because I know, but the, the, the questions and uh, comments are still coming in. Um, but, Doc, just this one on here, if you can read that one as well. Yeah, Nana is at, she says, my son is AC and my husband is AC. He didn't know he's AC until my son was born. Um, I think, you know, the key takeaway is what we've talked about. I think, Emmanuel, you said it. We just have to keep having these conversations and, and reminding people. A lot of people don't know. They do not know. People are walking around with sickle cell trait. They do not know. And one thing I actually also want to say is, so if someone has sickle cell trait, and that's one thing I, I spend a lot of time I research to, it doesn't mean you're out of the bag. People with sickle cell trait don't have complications that people with sickle cell disease do. But under extreme conditions, these people can have some really bad things happen. If mm -hmm. you think about it, right? So, you know, here in the U.S. is a famous football player. Um, he played in Denver. Denver has high altitude. So if you have sickle cell trait in high altitude, mm -hmm. if you're not well prepped, well conditioned, your body can actually have sickle cells. So people actually forget about that. And, and, mm -hmm. and for him, he had to have his spleen taken out. And, you know, you guys have probably seen a couple of athletes and that have died from sickle cell trait. And, and I always tell people this, you know, everybody knew about the whole George Floyd case. And one thing people actually didn't pay attention to is one of the things that the defense were using is George Floyd had sickle cell trait. And so his autopsy at the end, they did see sickling in there. And so... Wow possible that people with sickle cell trait you can have a sickled blood under extreme conditions so this is nothing the same as what fatu gave to you or emmanuel is talking about but it's something that we don't educate people about and i always say this i think for me it's possible people dying from sickle cell trait related complications in, especially in africa that do not know so ac to answer that person's question is another form of sickle cell trait i think the key message here is i don't care what race or ethnicity you are just know your sickle cell trait trait status first. If you have sickle cell disease, educate people. I know it can be challenging sometimes to kind of come out of the shell and educate people, but I think, you know, those days are behind us now. We, we just have to tell our own stories. And, and I would say, man, like you said, I tell patients all the time, you guys, it's your experience, it's your expertise. So if you're in the hospital and these doctors are talking like they know better, just remind them, you're the one living with the disease, not them. And it's challenging. Mm -hmm. And you can always fire the doctors. Remember, you can fire them. And I know it might not be fair to you, Gifty. In Ghana, it might be different and all of these. And I try to educate some of these doctors over there. But hopefully, hopefully people can just at least just get tested and know what, what status you are. I think that's a key takeaway. Absolutely. So what's the difference between S and C? Did you already explain that? Yeah, I think I touched on that briefly. So it's all about, it's all about the gene component, right? So if you think about 
So think about both of them being the same, right? Think about both of them being, it's veiling, veiling that has been switched from a genetic perspective. But for people with that have the C trait, what's happening with those that have C trait is under normal circumstances, that type of C trait can transport oxygen a little bit better compared to S. But it doesn't mean it's, it's better off than the other. I think that's a, that's a key takeaway. Okay. Um, Emmanuel and Fatou, um, how can f we as friends and family help you when you're in a crisis? Can I actually answer that? Yeah. So that's one of my best friends. So <laughs> but um, she already does a great job of helping me when I'm in crisis. Like um, the last crisis that I had, I couldn't walk. So um, her and my other friend got a trolley for me to be on. She stayed with me if I needed water. Like she wasn't judgmental. So I feel like as long as you're not judgmental, as long as you're like supportive, as long as you don't assume that I guess you know better or assume, as long as you don't make any assumptions at all and just listen to like the what the person with sickle cell is feeling and understand them and try to be as supportive as possible. I think that's like the best thing ever. Like. I know for the longest time, like before I got like my fiance and before I got these amazing friends, I used to be at the hospital by myself. And I know that used to like really take a toll on my mental health. So I think just like visiting, even if it's for five minutes, um, laughing, making jokes and just being supportive, I think that helps the most. Okay. Emmanuel? Um, yeah, just to agree with Fatu and, um, you know, talking on the phone is really important. Little things like that. Um, it takes your mind away from the pain. And, and so, you know, things that are able to do that help massively um, and, and, you know, take your focus away. So it's just about being present. And a lot of the time, you know, there's a, a force of habit to be like, oh, because you've got sickle cell, it must be this or it must be that. Just Just listen to us and hear what we have to say on how we're feeling at the time and respond mm. to that rather than, you know, responding to a textbook or, and I, I have to say this, um, mm. do not, I always tell people, do not Google sickle cell. And I say that because it is a horrid read. If you Google sickle cell, it reads disgustingly. So just talk to the person that you know who is living with sickle cell and ask about their experience and then, how, you know, how you can be a help to them. Fantastic. Kwame Abwaji says, Brother Emmanuel, my heart goes out to you and you know your right to, you know your rights. I think it's about the doctor that you were having problems with. Okay, Doc, this is for you. Quickly before we wrap up. You're on mute. All right, so this question is asking about L-glutamine since hydroxyurea is highly toxic. So so L-glutamine is, is a new therapy for sickle cell that has been, um, it's actually approved here in the U.S. now. And these are the disease-modifying therapies, right? So if you think about um, sickle cell disease, that genetic switch has to do with glutamine and valine, right? And so there's been some benefit with people that do take L-glutamine, and it does help. But it's to me, I always like to tell people, it doesn't mean it's going to be the same for everybody. So some people do benefit from hydroxyurea or hydroxycarbamine. I think that's how, what is typically called in the UK. But it doesn't mean it helps everybody because there are people who do, who do take hydroxyurea that have um, worse, worse complications too. So I think the most important thing for this person, Paul, is if you haven't tried L-glutamine, I think I can recommend that you definitely give it a shot, making sure it's the right one, you know, not something online where it's not approved, anything like that. And pay attention to the symptoms. Is it improving? Is it worsening? And, mm -hmm. and if you think it's, it's helping, definitely do it. It doesn't fix it. It helps you. And I think for those that do benefit from hydroxyurea, keep taking it and always make sure you're getting tested because that drug too, if you don't get chronic testing for it, it can also cause complications. So people forget about that. Okay. Next one. You talked about strokes, ulcers, and more, but with all the drugs for pain we take, please shed some light on gallstones and kidney stones. Is this seen often and how do we prevent and manage it? That is correct. So unfortunately with sickle cell, because of the pain crisis, you know, these individuals have to deal with, they have to take pain medications. What that happens is, you know, this, this is not just people with sickle cell, everybody, you know, taking any medicine over time, you build tolerance to it. Um, 
So I think what's important is that for those that are taking pain medications or to help decrease any kidney complications, stay hydrated. Hydration is a big part. Um, the second thing too is always add to your pain medication, non-pharmacologic therapy. So what am I even referring to? Acupuncture. I think, you know, something as small as even Emmanuel said, if you feel like calling somebody, you can talk to them, can help you take yourself off of the um, feeling more pain, do it. Add all those different things to help you mitigate those things. And, and I think if you're taking medicine for pain and it's not helping you, talk to your doctor. They might need to up the dose or they might need to switch you to something else and feel free to reach out. I think that's one thing people forget, you know, a lot of patients don't even realize that taking ibuprofen chronically can lead to um, kidney complications or even liver complications if you were to take acetaminophen. You know, people can reach out to me. I can have people they can refer to. And I think that's that's the big key key takeaway from, from that. I have someone here asking, how can how can people in the diaspora be a part of providing solutions to the many issues that sickle cell warriors face? I want to take this one. Mm -hmm. um, I think that for those of us in the diaspora, we always forget that there's another big group out there. I think the first step is educate yourself. And then two, do your due diligence to help provide funding for all those nonprofits on the ground doing the work. So, you know, I talk about my foundation. That's really what we do. But it's a whole lot more that people are doing over there. You know, I, I was in Nigeria two years ago for, for a conference for Sickle Cell by. Um, you know, the former president, um, Oluse Basanjo, he has a big foundation over there. And when I went to that conference, I was speaking about sickle cell trade, actually. After my talk, a lot of the patients came to me and they have all these organizers. And the biggest challenge was whenever we reach out to people outside Nigeria and the U.S. and U.K., they never get back to us. I think even sometimes just even responding to them, say, hey, I might not have the funding, but I'm, I'm listening to you. I'm going to do my best to support you. And if you have the opportunity, I, you know, some of us here, we have the resources. Let's take those resources and put them over there. I think that's that's the most important thing. Because those people need, to me, they need the most help. And they struggle um, the most over there back home. So if anybody wants to know, you can reach out to my foundation at NOP Foundation. And we can find ways we can work together to improve that too back home. Fantastic. Um, if my speakers can all add their email addresses and social media handles, and I will post it in the comments section uh, for people to reach out to you. Um, but I can't thank you guys enough. Um, what's this one saying? Doc, can you answer this one? Please, what did you say about Denver and individuals with sickle cell? Okay, so what I was referring to earlier quickly. So I was saying that... Yeah. People that have sickle cell trait need to also remember that there's precautions they need to take. So, so Denver is one of the places that has high altitude. So if you have sickle cell trait and you go to high altitudes and you are overexerting yourself, right, and you're improperly conditioned, your normal red blood cells can actually sickle. So these are four key things people have to remember if you have sickle cell trait. If you're dehydrated, if you're in low oxygen capacity environments, high altitudes, or think about scuba diving. When you go down the water, there's low oxygen there. Normal red blood cells can sickle. So Emmanuel, Fatu, and Gifty, you know, they unfortunately have blood that's already sickling all the time. For people that have sickle cell trait, that blood can change shape. And maybe it will make sense for you to remember, we talked earlier how sickle cell came about, right? So the way that we use sickle cell to prevent malaria was the fact that people with sickle cell trait, their blood is normal. But when those plasmodium parasites get in there, the blood will sickle. And so when that plasmodium parasite sees a sickle cell, it's going to die because it has no oxygen there. So that's what happened. So key takeaway, I was talking about Denver being high altitude and for people with sickle cell trait. Wherever you go, high altitude, um, pay close attention because people with sickle cell trait can have complications too. I'll add my stuff here. I do a lot of stuff about sickle cell trait too. So people can reach out and I can also provide more education about That'll that. That would be amazing. Absolutely. Thank you, Doc. I'll wait for you to type in your details. But last few words. So I'll start with Gifty. Um, you know, for people who are watching, what's your what's your advice or what's you know, what do you want to tell them about sickle cell and about, you know, what you guys face as family, um, living, you know, you lived with your sisters who had sickle cell. What what is your advice to them? First of all, I have to thank you so much, Denta, for this opportunity. And I think that what you have actually started with sickle cell is a good step for us to sort of like 
to support in every way that we can. The thing about Circle Cell is the knowledge of it. You need to you need to know, like the way um, Imano said before, if you find out that you are sick, you have sickle cell, whichever one, whether it's ACSS or AS or whichever one it is, you need to start to take good care of yourself because I've been told that from from the early stages that those with sickle cell don't leave till the age of 40 you know, or they can't leave after 40 years or something like that. But I've, I've known some people that are living with sickle cell and they are 60 years plus. So I, I think if the knowledge about sickle cell, and I remember when I was going to get married, my uncle, told me one thing. She, he just called me to one side and said, you know where you are coming from. So make sure whoever you're going to get married to is AA. It doesn't matter whether you love the person or not, but make sure that that person is AA. That was an advice I was actually given before getting to marriage. So that is something that I have actually taken with me like a handbag. And I would actually encourage most people who are taking on the journey to find out that for themselves, especially if you are AS or you know you are SS. Apparently you can marry someone with, if you are AS, you can marry someone with AS because that is where my parents come from. My mom is AS and my dad was AS and that's how they could be used. So it's a, something that it, it has to be, it has to be talked about. Absolutely. That is, yeah. Absolutely. Gifty, I can't thank you enough for sharing such an emotional experience in your journey with your sisters. We're praying for your your other sister who is battling with sickle cell. We hope that we will hear better news on her journey. Um, but she shouldn't, she shouldn't stop fighting. She should keep on. And I think um, Fatu, Doctor and Emmanuel would say the same thing, um, mm -hmm. that she should keep fighting. Um, and we'll be praying for you, you and the family. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Emmanuel. What's your What's your last words to people who are watching today about sickle cell and about how um, they should be treating you um, as as sickle cell carriers? Uh, so we're still human beings, first and foremost, you know. Um, and I feel it's important to understand that we are normal. We just have some abnormalities when it comes to our blood. And unless they present themselves, then, you know, treat us at face value and, and how we ask to be treated and, you know, don't treat us any different. Um, I just want to touch very quickly on a couple of things that were said with reference to um, medicine, pain medicine. Don't be afraid to question what you're taking. A lot of people just get given medicine and because they're given the medicine, you know, they just take it, you know, ask what the medicine is, what its benefit to you is. And also, you know, if you're living with sickle cell and your medicine isn't working, have that consultation with your hematologist. It's important to, you know, look into what is working versus what isn't working. Um, on what Gifty said as well, I, I know somebody who is 75, she's going to be 76 this year. She's living with sickle cell. So, you know, and this is why I said don't Google sickle cell. Because if you Google sickle cell, it will tell you that people with sickle cell don't live past 30 to 40. Um, so, you know, and, and lastly, sickle cell is a deadly disease and it does kill people and people are dying from sickle cell all the time. And the way to beat sickle cell is education. And, you know, when you're coming across a new partner, a new prospective partner, you have to ask the question. One thing for me personally, before I even get to a, a, a stage where I can be emotionally attached to somebody, I'm asking, so do you have sickle cell trait? I need to know that before anything can continue. And, you know, it is really, really important that we educate ourselves and ask questions to those that we know with sickle cell or sickle cell trait, because the more the discussion is had, the more it becomes normalized and in turn, change will happen. Absolutely. But do you find that people get offended if you're asking them what their blood type is? 
Um, sometimes, but I don't care to be honest because it's important to me. I've I've suffered in this life. I've really suffered, and I've seen my parents suffer, my siblings suffer, you know, um, to the point where my family have been called around my bad my bed, sorry, and told to say goodbye to me because I'm not going to survive, and I don't want anybody to have to go through that, and I don't want to knowingly especially knowingly and you know what dr steven said about making informed decisions is so important to knowingly bring somebody into this world knowing that they're, they're going to suffer their whole life because of your your decisions um this is it's not something that i'd be willing to to risk you know yeah yeah and have you found somebody um, pending. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> that was on a lighter note but thank you so much Emmanuel um you've been no real problem. thank I, you I, I felt your spirit. you've been so real and so open and just ah uh, thank you so much for reaching out um no I know um it was um, a friend of ours that kind of connected us right so yeah yeah um, I really 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 appreciate you coming on and sharing your story no Bye to you. You. My sister. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, piggyback off of what Emmanuel was saying. I yeah, go ahead. It's so important to get tested to make sure that you do not have sickle cell trait or anything. Because, like, even with my fiance, he got tested to make sure that, like, when we are ready to have kids, they wouldn't have sickle cell. Because I definitely know what I've been through, and I would. I think it's so selfish of me to bring a child into this world knowing that they have to go through the same things that I went through. So I think that just to be aware and just to know where you stand and just to know if like, if you do have sickle cell, if you do have the trait, if you do have the gene, just to make sure that your partner is in the clear. Hmm. I think that is extremely important. I think having compassion towards people with sickle cell, because I know I I need it a lot. I am I'm always like shifty sometimes in my mood. Sometimes I do want to be by myself. Sometimes I do need my friend support. Sometimes I am too sick to go out. Sometimes I don't have the energy to go out. So I think that just being there to support your friends and just letting them know that you're there for them, it's extremely important. And I think that like having sickle cell has definitely taught me to be grateful for life because there's been so many times where I thought I was gonna die, where um, the doctors have told me, who can I call so we can like pull the switch if you do go under, like it's scary. It's extremely scary. Mm -hmm. And just to like, yeah, just be aware, just be nice, just be grateful for life, be grateful for every day that you have, be grateful for the people around you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fatu. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Dr. Stephen, your last words um, to the masses who are watching, um, somebody that, you know, has a child with, with um, sickle cell, doesn't know how to cope, you know, all of that. I think as well as we looking at, you know, individuals that have um, sickle cell, there's also families that are affected by this as well even though they're not going through the, the pain, but they obviously they feel the pain that their child or their sibling is going through. What are the th um, things that you would say to them? You are right. I think for me, you know, the caregiver component is so important. I think the first thing I would say is, um, one, understand that these individuals battling sickle cell are probably the most resilient people you ever meet. Mm. And they're not alone. And, and the second thing I'll tell those families is take care of yourself. Because if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of these people you want to take care of. And, and the third thing I'll tell them is it's okay uh, because things are going to be okay. And we are always going to keep learning. Um, the other thing I want to add too is that, you know, for, for anybody having living with sickle cell disease, uh, make sure you reach out. You know, you, you guys battle so much. Girls and girl, guys battle so much. So, um, don't, don't, don't be shy to reach out. You know, the people you're reaching out to, if they're not responsive to you, they probably shouldn't be in your circle. You guys deserve that. So, so don't be shy to reach out to the people that need help. And my last thing I want to say is to all the healthcare providers out there, to, to just be better. And, and, you know, it's, it's okay to admit that we do not know, 
I think that's the first step that we need to take. I do not care whether you're in hematology, cardiology, obstetrics and gynecology. You tell me. We do not know it all. These patients, they are the experts, and we have to open our minds so they can teach us so we can work collaboratively to help them feel better. I think, you know, one of my favorite things I always say is each one teach one. And mm. so we need to make sure we teach ourselves, but most importantly, we learn from these patients. That that's that's the only thing I would say. Dr. Stephen, I don't know what to say. Um thank you so much for reaching out. It's it's been a a learning curve for me as well. Um I've learned a lot from all the guests today. Um, it's been very emotional as well. And I, I think I'm feeling uh, emotions now. I think we, we all need to do better um, on educating people on sickle cell. And like Emmanuel says, like they, they are human. You know, let's not forget that aspect of things and um, treat them as such. Um, but I think that, you know, we need to do probably more awareness in Africa because um, I feel like in the Western world, we, we can get some type of support. But I just I'm just sitting here thinking, what is a child going through in, in Ghana right now that has sickle cell? You know, um, are their parents even listening to them? You know, has their parents even got a job um, that they're thinking about, the you know, them getting work than, than the child that has sickle cell? So there's there's a lot to think about and there's a lot of awareness for us to do. Um, for anybody that wants to support, and Emmanuel has his foundation, his charity, his awareness um, wants UK. I think that, you know, if you're on Instagram, please do follow him. Um, also, Dr. Stephen has the foundation as well and the podcast that he's doing. I think that let's all connect and let's support and let's learn um, and let's be more human um, and more loving and caring. I think that's that's vital. Um, but I can't thank you enough for taking out your two hours time, guys, to be on the Tonight Show. Um, I, I just actually flew in from France this morning and, um, well, this afternoon, I got in about an hour ago before the show started. And um, I, I, I'm glad it happened today. I, I, I think I'm going away um, to really reflect on how I, I promote using my platform to really educate people on sickle cell um, as much as possible. Um, again, I'm sending hugs to Gifty, to Manuel, to Fatu, and to Doc virtually. Um, God bless you all for the work that you do. And um, thank you so, so much for being strong and being open um, with us today. Um, my guests are really, really uh, excited. Thank you all for watching. Um, Cecilia, True Life Stories, G, um, boss baby talk, everybody that's watched, please don't forget to share because I think that, you know, conversations like this, you, it's not just you that should be enjoying. Um, you should be sharing it to loved ones. Um, there might be somebody that, you know, their child has sickle cell, but they don't know. We can't wait for them to have be 40 to find out they have sickle cell. Let's get them help as soon as possible. God bless you all. And thank you so much for watching the show today. Thank you all. Um, thank you, Fatu. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Ima. And thank you, Gifty. Um, it has been... Ah, it's, it's been a tough one, actually, for me today. Um, but I think we've learned a lot. It's the, it's the learning curve, right? Um, we all need to do better. We all need to be encouraged. Um, and understand that when somebody's in pain, they're in pain. I, like, as I'll explain, I don't know if... Some of you might miss it. I'm a pediatric nurse. And sometimes, you know, we see the patients come in with me. Nah, they're not in that much pain. We just gave them, you know, this painkiller five minutes ago. Wait for it to work. You know, all of these things, we, we do need to do much, much better. We do need to do much, much better. Thank you so much for watching. Again, I want to say a big thank you to... Um, I'm going to connect all the speakers together as well. So Gifty, Emmanuel, I'm going to share all your details so at least you can network and you know support each other as much as possible if you don't mind and um, please let me know in the, in our private chat if you don't mind at all i'll get you doctor's number you guys can connect as well um a big thank you to um express pay for um, sponsoring the show and um, please do that to transfer money to ghana um again a big thank you to uh vesta london beauty for her lip glaze 
Um, there it is. It's actually my baby sister, her lip glaze. Please go online to Vesta London Beauty and get one of her lip glosses. Um, again, I must say a big thank you to Designer T, who's given me this Ghana Superwoman top. Yes, you can get it in Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea, whatever African country that you rep, even UK, you can get one of these tops. I'm going to put the link um, in the box so you can go on there and order yours. Let's be patriotic as well as much as possible. We need to make sure that we're very patriotic. Um, I'm sharing that with you now. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and share the pages as much as possible. Um, next week, I will bring you a different topic. Um, if, there's, if there's any particular topic actually that you'd like me to discuss, also please do let me know. Um, so I put that on the agenda. Um, but yeah, thank you everybody. Thank you so, so, so much again. Um, my daughter Shea Butter, Princess Aria Shea Butter, please go online and get your Shea Butter Black Soap as well. And Aya Cards does amazing um, cards as well, birthdays, christenings, whatever have you, go on there and do that. And if you're looking for work experience in Ghana, internship in Ghana, um, if you're a health professional, if you're a um, finance accountant, whatever it is, whatever profession that is that you want to have work experience in Ghana, please do click on the link um, and you can have work experience um, at a place in Ghana. Um, so, guys, thank you so much. I will see you next week, same time, same place. God bless you all. Bye-bye.